big house, and if any Indian tries to stop me, I'll blast him. You know, the only thing more pathetic than Indians on TV is Indians watching Indians on TV. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Ian back again for another episode of Native Film Talk. Today, Thunderheart, 1992, starring Val Kilmer, directed by Michael Apted. So this was, uh, you know, initial thoughts, I like this movie. There's not a whole, there's a few things that I didn't like, like really didn't like, but overall, solid movie, you know, it's just under two hours. For 1992, this was a hell of a step in the right direction. And Last of the Mohicans also came out in 1992. Seeing Last of the Mohicans and Thunderheart come out in the same year, you'd think like, oh man, oh man, we're in for a wave, a new wave of native representation at the major motion picture level. Unfortunately, there was a big kind of drop off after this. I think Dances with Wolves really paved the way for this. And I think that was a fascination with natives in Hollywood for a little bit at, at this point and uh yeah so thank thankfully Thunderheart was made so Michael Apt had also directed Incident at Oglala which came out in 1992 also um this was done before done by a different production company it's a documentary it's not a motion picture it, it is really around the controversy of Leonard Peltier and getting the two FBI murders pinned on him and getting him sentenced, you know, two life sentences and where he currently sits still in prison. And Leonard Peltier, they interview him, they interview John Trudell, they interview a lot of AIM activists. They go through the whole timeline of how they got to really the point where they are in the movie, which is documenting the 70s. Um, and the incident at Wounded Knee documenting the really infighting within the Lakota Nation, within the Oglala Sioux um, Reservation, like how they describe in Thunderheart and how Richard Wilson, the tribal chairperson, really was like uh, kind of doing backdoor deals. He really did hire goons, guardians of the Oglala Nation, to protect, quote-unquote, the community. And was just a real seedy individual. And there really was a lot of civil unrest because of really the government's mis, you know, ha handling of how they were dealing. Like really, Thunderheart is a true story, even though it isn't. Um, well, why I bring up Incident at Oglala, I'll, I'll go over it when I go over the cast review. But you can pick, if you watch Incident at Oglala first, which is what I did, and then re-watched Thunderheart right afterwards you'll see so many parallels between the two it's crazy like they they do say like oh this is based on true events at the beginning of the movie thunderheart but when you watch incident in oglala you're like well, well shit this is a true movie this is a true story <laughs> you remove kind of walter um you know graham green's character and val kilmer's character there's pretty much not a whole lot that's that's you, you could make the argument that it's pretty much the exact same movie or how, how it, it is reality at that point so overall I, I really enjoyed this movie because of that i think knowing what i know now like having watched incident at oglala which you know it was always news to me i always knew who leonard pilcher was i kind of knew generally that he just got screwed over and that it was generally understood in indian country that like hey free leonard the peltier and you always, every time there's a new president, you always see the, uh, you know, free Leonard Peltier, Mr. President, you know, do the right thing kind of thing. So I just was like on board with that message because Indian country seemed to be behind it. But I had never known that, like how that all actually played out. And so I'm not going to talk about that because it's incident in Oglala. It's free. Well, I say free. But if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, you can watch it. Um, it's, it's included in Prime. So highly encourage everyone listening Go check out Incident at Oglala. It is a documentary from 1992, so it is dated. Um, it is, they don't show names, which is an odd thing for a documentary. You know how normally documentaries, when the person is first being introduced, they in, they have like their name tag on the bottom for a, a split second. Or if you haven't seen them on screen since like the beginning of the doc, they kind of bring their name and their title back up. They don't do that throughout the entire movie, so it's kind of difficult to follow. 
but the information in itself is great because John Trudell's in there, and that's when John Trudell first met the director, Michael Apted, and so he was real interested in getting John Trudell in Thunderheart because of the relationship he carved with him during the documentary incident at Oglala. Um, but Leonard Peltier is interviewed in there. There's some higher up um, big wigs from the FBI that were involved in the case that are involved that are interviewed for the movie. And uh, it's just, you know, it's a good story for someone like me who just didn't know anything really about it outside of the outcome. So it, it was good for me to see. And then watching Thunderheart right after, it's a great companion film. Highly encourage you guys to go see it. So directed by Michael Apted, but also a screenplay was done by John Fusco. And this guy's interesting. He also wrote Hidalgo. He's basically a white dude enamored by native people. Like <laughs> he supposedly lived on the Pine Ridge Res for like five years and had a strong connection with the community and was quote-unquote adopted into the Aglala Lakota in 1989. I have no idea what that process looks like. I don't know. You know, Navajo people, we don't adopt people. And if we do, I'm never a part of that. Like, I'm not a part of those discussions. <laughs> I don't know what adopting a non-native person or a non-community member into the community looks like, but... Apparently that happened with this dude, John Fusco, and he he rocks it. You know, he wears beaded everything. You look up his name and stuff, he's got, like, beaded cowboy hats and crap. Um, but anyway, that's the, besides the point. Beside the point. So during his time when he lived on the Pine Ridge Res, he had um, crafted a relationship with uh, Frank Fool's Crow, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the um, cast review, but Grandpa Sam Reaches was inspired by a real-life Frank Fool's Crow. And initially, so I'll go back to John Fusco, when he was approached to do this movie by TriStar to write the screenplay for the movie, this was supposed to be initially a reservation cop going to the big city story. And John Fusco didn't want to do that, so he actually just agreed to it and said, yeah, I'll do that. But really, he ended up writing Thunderheart. And he went back to them thinking, like, oh, they're going to hate it. And they loved it. You know, they ended up loving the movie, and they ended up doing that. So good for him. Because a reservation cop going to the big city, who knows what the hell that would look like. Um, but apparently there were some serious roadblocks with this film. Uh, but Robert freaking De Niro is a producer. And he came a producer of this movie. He went and um, co-founded Tribeca Productions with Jane Rosenthal. And so Tribeca Productions is a big part of this movie. And why also, in, in, in kind of looking at the making of this movie, of why this movie ever happened, there were some serious roadblocks with this movie. And, you know, when Robert De Niro and Tribeca Productions came on board, a lot of the roadblocks got removed. And it's a big reason why this movie got greenlit. So, you know, hats off to Robert De Niro. Also, fun fact about Michael Apted's incident in Oglala, the documentary was produced by Robert Redford, so that's pretty cool. And in, in, in the early 90s, you could argue even up to now, you know, we really needed, like, white people, Bilaganas, Wasichus, we really needed their help to tell our story. And people like Robert De Niro, Robert Redford, you know, even Clint Eastwood most recently with Indian Horse, it's good that they are willing to kind of put themselves out there on our behalf, use their namesake, use their popularity, their notoriety, their credibility to get our story, give us a chance to tell our stories. Unfortunately, it's usually, you know, a non-native person telling the story for us. But, and I feel like in Thunderheart, in this case, you know, it was a win. It was a good thing. Uh, overall, there's some problems and I'll talk about that. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest, I really didn't want to like this movie. I just, you, you, when you watch this, you just get a feeling as a native person, you're like, I shouldn't like this movie for some weird reason. Maybe it's because there's like hints of white savior. There's hints of like Lone Ranger and Tonto like dynamic. There's hints of this like white superiority, but I didn't see that. I really was trying to look out for that and yeah, you could make that spin and say that, but I don't know. It's like Avatar, but nowhere near as cringy. You know, the crux of the story is a white person who has native heritage that doesn't claim it because he has a bad history with his alcoholic father, you know, and this gives, I think why it makes me feel like I shouldn't like this is I think it ultimately like perpetuates to non-native people that their heritage might be special. 
you know, oh, my great grandma's a Cherokee princess. It's always a princess. It's always Cherokee. And I really think that this movie can give like non-native people a complex of just like, oh man, that 1% of native ancestry on my 23andMe, on my, you know, ancestry.com results. Oh my gosh. Maybe, maybe that means something. Maybe I come from somebody really special. Maybe, maybe my lineage is like, maybe I have strong blood in my, you know, in my veins. Maybe I have strong native blood. I think that's like why I didn't really, why I want to not like this movie. But honestly, if you remove Al Kilmer's character from the movie, this movie's spectacular. You know, I mean, this, this movie's solid. Um, it's a real reservation. They didn't, you know, glitz up things. They didn't dress up things to make them seem like they weren't. Like, the costumes were on point. The language, the Lakota language is on point. I love that every time that Lakota is spoken on screen, there's no subtitles. There's nothing left to interpretation. I think I think that was really profound, especially for 1992 in a modern movie where native language is being spoken. There's no subtitles. You have somebody else. In most cases, it's Graham Greene, John Trudell's character. So like Jimmy Looks Twice and Walter Crowhorse, they're translating on behalf of Grandpa or they're translating to somebody. They're explaining what they're saying to you. And that really is the outsider experience being non-native or a non-native speaker to them like there's no subtitles in real life they tell you what the hell is happening and i think i really appreciated that part of it and that experience of and i think john fusco him being an outsider supposedly living on the pine ridge res i think he wrote that into his screenplay because that's what he had grown accustomed to being an outsider having that outside dialogue um having that dialogue explained to him because he's an outsider so i appreciated that Ultimately, this is really based on real people, and I'll go over them in the cast review, but ARM, like, they, they manipulated a few things, like ARM, Aboriginal Rights Movement, um, I mean, it's just AIM, American Indian Movement, <laughs> so they, like, didn't really do a good job there, but, uh, yeah, cast review, let's get after it. But first and foremost, Val Kilmer as Ray Lavoy, aka Batman in Batman Forever, aka Iceman from Top Gun, Jim Morrison in The Doors, Nick Rivers from Top Secret, Mad Mardigan from Willow, and then freaking Doc fucking Holiday from Tombstone. It's clear that he's the draw. He's the reason why probably this movie was greenlit, why this was made. You know, Robert De Niro and Val Kilmer eventually craft like a, you know, they, they, they co-star in a movie later, three years later in Heat. So... I think that they definitely, he's the guy that put the butts in the seats. So, you know, it's interesting. He's not native, but he is a 132nd Cherokee, and he really leans into it at times. There was an interview done with this movie, and they ask him about it, and he identifies, I don't know, he goes through this. He's a Santa Fe resident now, and he's a Santa Fe, you know, white person, so he's... He's enamored with it. He wears jewelry. He wears turquoise. He wears like sterling silver necklaces and stuff. And he's 100% Santa Fe now. But at the time in 1992, when I saw some interviews, he was kind of like this movie helped him, quote unquote, reconnect with his native heritage. I don't know what the hell that looked like. But, you know, I, I just didn't like that he felt obligated to say like, yeah, you know, I'm part Indian. I'm part Indian. I you know my my dad's grandfather was Cherokee and yada yada yada. You know, and I'm just like ugh, ugh. <laughs> you know, he said, and and I quote, "My father's grandmother was Cherokee. He was raised on reservation land in New Mexico for most of his youth. So I grew up with stories that were real life, romantic stories of the Wild West. A lot of the stories that my father told me." that happened to him when he was a kid are quite vivid and got me interested in Indians. Does that sound like a guy who should be identifying as Native American? <laughs> no, it doesn't. But he does, you know, now, at least like later in life, he definitely has said like, yeah, I'm Native, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. It's whatever. So it was a white guy playing Native. Um, which kind of works for the story, though. Um, I think if you, you modern, if you recasted this movie today, you could have casted you know, a light skinned native and you know made this movie. I think that would make this work. There's nothing wrong with the character and the story. It's just Val Kilmer himself. He's just a white guy playing uh, someone who's supposedly a quarter 
so Oglala Sioux in this movie. But I think that, yeah, you could definitely, if you remade Thunderheart and just put like a light skinned native in there, or even just like an ambiguously, you know, I, I don't know, someone who doesn't look on the nose native, but is native, you recast him in this movie and boom, you're done. You know, you can, you can redo this movie and it would be fantastic. Um, Sam Shepard is Frank Cattell, who is uh, Ray, Ray LaVoy's boss. He's the FBI agent. Graham Greene is Walter Crowhorse. This is my favorite Graham Greene movie. Um, Graham Greene's character kills it. Walter Crowhorse is my favorite Graham Greene character, hands down. He really showed a lot of levity. For 1992, you know, he really challenged the notion modern time notion that we're stoic indians that we're just quiet you know he showed that we can be a freaking wise ass you know i have so many uncles that are like him there were so many just period pieces of us kind of cracking out of that shell showing the humor but nothing modern day we were all just you know fargo we were all like shep proudfoot just quiet stoic we were like chief and one flew over the cuckoo's nest don't say a damn word and so Graham Greene really broke the mold and broke out of that. And I really appreciated that. It was awesome. Uh, Fred Ward as Jack Milton. I mostly know him from Tremors, you know, being Kevin Bacon's brother in the movie <laughs> and from uh, Escape from Alcatraz. But Fred Ward was supposed to be um, real life based on um, the tribal chairman from the incident at Oglala from, you know, the 1970s, Richard Wilson. And he definitely, this should have been a native person too. You know, you recast, you redo this movie, this should be a Lakota person. Because throughout the movie, he drops, and it sounds painful. He's like, hey, wish day. <laughs> and it's just cringy. I'm just like, ugh, that's, that's, he's in Tremors, and he's saying wish day. I'm like, what's wrong with, I don't know. They should have, they should have casted a native guy. He's wearing hats with, like, beaded brims and stuff. I'm just like, ugh. Or beaded bands around the hat. Um, and then Sheila Tusi as Maggie Eagle Bear. This was her debut film. She killed it. I love Maggie Eagle Bear in this. Uh, Maggie Eagle Bear, also based on a real life character, and you learn in the incident in Oglala that AIM activist Anna Marie Aquash, who is a school teacher, also who also had her son shot in a drive by um, by goons, just like in the movie, just like in there, and then all just like in the movie, and Anna Marie, she was also murdered. So I'm not sure. I don't. It wasn't the exact same way, but obviously she was murdered, and it was to believe that we was connected to the goons. So I mean, there's a lot of connections there. And then uh, Ted Thin Elk, aka Chief Ted Thin Elk, he is Grandpa Sam Reaches. This was also his debut film, and he was fantastic. He's probably my favorite character in the entire movie. Um, no, 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 he is my second favorite. Walter Crowhorse, easily my favorite. And then Sam Reaches, Grandpa Sam Reaches. His character was inspired by the real-life Frank Fool's Crow, basically just him. And Frank, Frank Fool's Crow was at Wounded Knee Massacre or was alive during that time. And so, really, Grandpa Sam Reaches is, Frank's fool, is Frank Fool's Crow, who, as I mentioned, John Fusco met and had a great, you know, supposedly had a good relationship with him. And so Grandpa is essentially Frank Fool's Crow, basically. Um, so this is a fun fact. Uh, Frank Fool's Crow actually passed away before the film was greenlit in 1989. Frank, uh, he told John Fusco that, like, hey, if you're making a movie about this, you know, just kind of being a wise-ass native, he said that I want a, I want a big fat director chair that says Chief Fool's Crow on it. And when he heard about that movie, he was like, that's my only, that's my only wish. So I can sit there with my chair that says Chief Fool's Crow on it. And I can just sit there every single day and like watch everything happen. It's like that's my only wish. And unfortunately he passed away before they started shooting. But during the shooting of the movie every single day they honored him by placing a chair there. And an empty chair on set every day. And it had a star quilt laid on it. And so that was like in honor of him. So they got to, he, he did get to have his own chair in a way. So that was pretty cool that they had a lot of respect for him. Just shows like John Fusco had a lot of reverence for him. And then the last character I'm going to go over, uh, John Trudell is Jimmy Looks Twice. This is essentially his actual character in real life. Like the same person that's interviewed in Incident at Oglala, it's, it's John Trudell. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean, this is really Leonard Peltier's story. 
but John Trudell is playing himself. You know, John was also a Vietnam veteran. He was also has burned an American flag at the FBI building, just like Jimmy looks twice. You know, that's one of his felony charges that they mention. Um, but John Trudell did this because his family died in a house fire. He had a pregnant wife and three kids. They all died in the house fire. And it's always been believed that the FBI set his house on fire or they were the ones behind all of that. And so John Trudell afterwards, you know, went straight over the FBI building, burned the fucking American flag on, you know, in front of the building. Because if that's what you believe that the FBI did that, why, why wouldn't you, you know? So Jimmy Looks Twice is basically, you know, the AIM leader activist, Leonard Peltier. So they're trying to pin Leo Fasolk's murder on him, but also the murder of like two other FBI agents before the movie. And um, that's essentially, you know, the real life story. Um... Overall, though, the Native representation in this is legit. There was over, you know, 200 uh, Natives that were cast as, you know, extras in this movie. And that's a win. That's a freaking win. You know, I, I really think we were riding off the wave of Dances with Wolves, but fuck, I'll, I'll take it. At this point in 1992, like, there were real Natives in this. You know, people with long hair. There was no red face. There was no extensions. There was no war paint. It was just natives being natives, and they were on screen. They got real natives for this, and it felt really authentic. It felt really nice to see, and going back and watching this, I was really expecting to see a lot of uh, stuff that I just misremembered, and I'm like, ooh, how did I miss that, or how did I, why did I like that when I was younger, and I didn't see a whole lot of that, and I, I was pretty surprised. So let's go over the plot review. I'm going to try to go through it, but I want to be thorough at the same time. That's kind of my thing is being thorough with the plot. So this might take a while because this was a two hour movie. And and I try to focus on things in the plot that are like native related. And this entire movie is native related. <laughs> um, but OK, the movie opens up. This story was inspired by true events, by events that took place on several American Indian reservations during the 1970s. And then we have opening scene really with some ghost dancers. But most importantly, you see the murder of Leo Fastelk at sunrise. So he's the reason why we have the FBI come to picture, come into the picture, because we learn that, uh, you know, tribal police have no jurisdiction uh, during murders because that's a federal offense and federal offenses need to be handled by the FBI, which is true. That still happens to this day. Um, and flash to uh, Val Kilmer in Washington, D.C., you know, he's an up-and-comer, he's a high performer, but we also learn that he's a legacy. You know, his, his uh, not his biological father, but his dad's like a retired colonel. And, you know, his super his superior calls him to the office in D.C. and it's like reading off his accolades. He's like, hey, you know, we, we see that you're an up-and-comer, you're good to go. I'm looking over your family tree. You're Lithuanian, Scottish, Irish, French, and American Indian. Sioux Indian, isn't it? And... Of course, it's the FBI, so you know everything. Ray tries to lie and be like, I don't know anything about that. You know, my father, I never knew him. They're like, yeah, actually, he died when you were seven. <laughs> and so he's trying to, like, lie as an FBI agent, which you're not supposed to do, but it's beside the point. He then eventually divulges that, like, yeah, my, you know, I'm, my dad was half, so I'm a quarter. And um, basically, you know, foreshadowing that, like, hey, you're... You're going to learn some stuff because he's hiding the history of his father. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of like dangle this in front of you of like, oh, we're going to learn a lot about his heritage in this. And they kind of just dangle that a handful of times of like who his father really is. And we learn who he is later on in the movie. And he gets assigned a case in the Badlands because of a homicide. Um, and we learn that ARM, Aboriginal Rights Movement, is... Uh, you know, it is a part of the civil unrest in the community because there's a civil war on the res between non-traditional natives and traditional natives, which is why there's so many murders. They're kind of saying that's why anyway. Um, and what's interesting is Ray asks, because he's an FBI agent, he's like, okay, sounds good. What's my cover? There isn't going to be any. And I quote from his superior, you're going in there as who you are, an American Indian federal officer. I happen to believe with a Native American representative in there, we can diffuse the tension and prove relations. As long as our PR officers are disseminating information that we're sending the Indian Indians one of their own, nobody, nobody's going to ask you to weave any baskets or make it rain. 
So he's off. Clearly, the white people have no idea what they're dealing with, including Ray Lavoie. And at this point in the movie, Ray Lavoie denies all Native American heritage. So they really want him to lean into this being American Indian, being the token for the FBI, being the American Indian uh, FBI agent. And he's just like, I did, you know, I disown everything connected to that. Um, you know, so eventually he flies out there, gets there. He gets picked up by his new boss for the assignment, Sam Shepard, who is Frank played, who is Frank Cattell. So Frank Cattell, you know, <laughs> I will say this. This is one, one gripe I had. I did notice this time around. Anytime there's a native moment um, with Val Kilmer, I say a native moment. Anytime he's faced with native regalia, he's struggling with something, there's always like a flute or a drum ominous in the background. Um, when he lands at the airport, he's looking at this like native exhibit at the South Dakota airport. And it's just like a regalia kind of hung up under some glass. And you start to hear a flute letting you know, like, he's connecting. He's wondering what's going what's going to happen. And he's wondering, like, I don't know. It's just kind of odd that that was like kind of a through line throughout the movie. But he links up with his uh, superior Frank. And he's been on the res for a while. You can tell. You know, Frank, a.k.a. Cooch, he's a hardened dude. He doesn't like the new guy because he's messing up his vibe. He's clearly got, you know, everything figured out. He doesn't need some hot shot new guy. You know, he tells him, you coming up here is like pissing in the wind. He's not happy that he's there. And then enter the poverty porn. This is where I didn't like it. So Frank takes Ray back to the res. And they're driving into the Badlands. And there's this, you know, as soon as they get there, <clears throat> coming into the res, you know, Bear Creek Reservation sign. It's turned over on its side. It's not even sticking in the ground anymore. You're driving on a dirt road. There's res kids playing in the dirt. And they're basically like, look at this, the third world country, slap dag in the middle of America, used to be all theirs on up into Canada. This is what they got left with them. And Kilmer just has this like moment where he just like says under his breath, like, Jesus, you know, setting the tone that these people are poor. Look at these poor Indians. And uh, I think this is different for some people. It's going to be different for people because I was born and raised on the res. Um, I mean, granted, it's Navajo res, not, you know, the res that they shot on, not Oglala, but it just looked like home, you know? I mean, there's, it's definitely a rougher part of my town. My, my town doesn't look like that. The entire town doesn't look like that. I mean, I grew up in a double wide trailer, just like everybody else. <laughs> and there were these like kind of makeshift shacks that you see and people that, you know, just live in these homes forever and they just add additions and it just kind of looks disheveled from the outside. But when you watch it again, it's just like nobody's panhandling. You know, these two outsiders, Frank and Ray, they're like, Jesus, look at this third world country. But nobody's like sick. Nobody's like looks hungry. Everyone's just chilling. They're just playing in the street. They're just like watching like what the hell are these white people doing here? We're driving by real slow, looking at us kind of thing. Like there's not, I think that's something that as an outsider, I'd be curious to see someone who's like never been to like a reservation or spend a lot of time there what they would see when they look at this because i'm sure there's like a, oh look at these poor people because that was like some criticism from some people of like why this movie is like poverty porn all over again and i'm just like nah i don't see that but i could see why people would see that um so then they basically go straight to the murder scene of leo fast elk you know the, and there's a lot of like jabs at you know, people's names. So like Ray Lavoie, Leo Fast Elk. And then Frank tells him, not fast enough, I guess. So like, that's great writing right there. Because they set up who the villains are. They set up the ignorance. They set up what people actually would say about natives, you know, standing over a dead body and making fun of his name. That's that's life for you folks. But that's some solid writing. And then as they're investigating the murder, we get introduced to Walter M.F.N. Crowhorse. Graham Greene himself shows up on a motorcycle in like a makeshift gurney. Because he needs to take him to the journey. He needs to make sure his body gets, you know, is uh, is able to be taken uh, to a place where he can take the journey. Because he's face down. He can't be face down and dead. He's got to be face up so his spirit can leave. And he starts to offer a prayer in the four directions. And he's tackled by Val Kilmer, by Ray Lavoie. And then eventually they find out that Graham Greene's a cop. And you're like, shit, sorry, buddy. <clears throat> and, uh, and gosh... The humor by 
Walter Kurhorst by Graham Greene is just great. As he's like knee in the man's back trying to interrogate him, Ray Lavoie says to him, This is restricted area, Geronimo. This is Indian land. Maybe you guys got off the wrong exit, yeah? You guys looking for Mount Rushmore? <laughs> All while having your hands cuffed behind you, not explaining you're a cop. You know, Graham characters, Graham Greene's character is like the shit. He's just like, he's awesome. You know, he's like, I'm a full-blooded Oglala born Sioux, Oglala Sioux born on this reservation. And they reveal that he's tribal police and they get off him. They're like, oh, sorry, man. And it's so funny because it's like news travels fast on the res. One person finds out something and it's juicy. Everybody knows. And so word got out already that Ray Lavoie is coming and that he's the Indian agent. And so he already kind of gives him the like, hey, buddy, kind of thing. And he calls him Cola throughout the whole movie, K-O-L-A. And Cola is supposed to be friend. And I don't know if he says it at this point when he doesn't know who he is. And I asked a friend who is a Lakota speaker about this. And, you know, I looked it up online too. And it used to be something that, like, had a deeper connection. But, like, now it's just, like, friend. And now I think that in in this movie, like he was saying Cola, like ironically throughout the movie, and obviously it changes. I think it morphs because by the end they actually are friends, um, or they actually do have some good relations. But uh, yeah, so and then next is like Sam, uh, Frank Cattell, and Ray. They they go off and they're driving around. You're getting the lay of the land, lay of the land, because uh, we learned that more homicides have been committed in on on this particular res than the entire state of South Dakota, you know, and then they're talking about the Civil War, the traditionalists versus the uh, non-traditionalists. They want to go back to, you know, teepees and buffalo hunts, and they're against the pro-government Indians, you know, like Leo Fast Elk. And Leo Fast Elk was a part of the tribal council, so it's believed that people from the Aboriginal rights movement from ARM had killed Leo Fast Elk because he's a part of the tribal council. And so... This is like all good backstory. This is exactly stuff out of um, Incident at Oglala. So it's interesting too when they're explaining all this, just driving around the res. <clears throat> Val Kilmer hears all this and he's like wondering, you know, typical white person lying about the res. They should clean up their garbage in their front yards first. And then his boss, nothing to be ashamed of, Ray. They're your own people, aren't they? They are not my people. And it's interesting because that line's played with multiple times throughout the movie as, like, Ray's going through his identity crisis, referring to they're not my people, the white people, they're not my people, the, you know, Oglala. But as they finish their first conversation, um, as they, you know, drive off the res and they're going to their hotel, they see their first interaction with the goons, the guardians of the Oglala nation. And we also get introduced to Jack Milson, a.k.a. Richard Wilson, the tribal chairman. Um... We see that they set up roadblocks all around, and they're, they 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 harass the natives who are traditional. And while they're at this stop, you can see them like chucking, emptying out all of their belongings. You know, they see a headdress, they see anything that resembles any kind of ceremonial um, paraphernalia or any kind of traditional regalia. They're throwing it out. They're trying to make an example out of it. Um, and so that's just setting the tone for what the what the goons were about, what their MO was, why they were there. They were hired guns by the tribal chairperson to really enact, you know, re- really to just push an agenda. And that was to um, push back on the aim to make sure they didn't get their way to, like, scare them off, essentially, because he was getting kickbacks from the government. You know, he was misappropriating funds. He just wanted the good times to continue. Typical tribal chairman, you know. Uh, So flash to the hotel. I say typical tribal chair. That's a stereotype that's played with on Indian country about tribal chairman. Anytime there's a crooked tribal chairman, it's always assumed he's getting kickbacks. He's always assuming that we always assume they're getting getting kickbacks. We always assume they're embezzling stuff, that um, there's nepotism involved. So I shouldn't have dismissed that like that. That's usually what we mean, what I mean by typical tribal chairman, um, if you weren't aware. So flash of the hotel. Then they get educated kind of about the other arm members. They learn about Maggie Eagle Bear and Jimmy looks twice. And they're saying like, hey, he did. This is where they say he burned an American flag on the steps of the FBI building. And uh, yeah, so they plan to ambush Jimmy 
and arrest him. So that's where they're plotting this. And then they go after him. The next day they go after him in the middle of a sweat. So he's in a sweat. Um, they open the flap of the sweat, the sweat lodge, you know, armed to the teeth, you know, shotguns and assault rifles, and they f- lift the flap open. And he, and so I love this scene because this is an authentic-ass sweat lodge. This isn't no Sedona sweat lodge kind of thing. You know this is a goddamn, like, sweat lodge because there's a blanket over the front. <laughs> It's a freaking blanket over the front as the flap. Like, that's that's what, you know, I'm Navajo. Our sweat lodges are probably a tad different. But it's the same thing. I love that he was using a pitchfork to carry the coals. That's what we use, just regular pitchfork. You know, more coals back into the inside. Um, I like it, you know. In the in the past, I'm sure you had some kind of like hide or skin, like buckskin or buffalo, like they did in the movies. But this is modern day. You just get a thick ass blanket and you put it over the front. I thought that was awesome. Uh, my only problem with the scene is probably it's 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 wishy washy of like whether it's a problematic. Everybody comes out of the sweat lodge of the sweat with towels on. Nobody goes in with a towel. Are you kidding me? As they're like, all right, everyone, come out holding guns all them all at gunpoint everyone walks out with a towel no and you're supposed to be walking out like butt ass naked or in you just in your chonies or if you're navajo you go in bare ass with your just your string and that's just a navajo thing but you know don't ask me what the string's for if you're really interested google navajo sweat lodge string there you go um but all the times i've been in a sweat that's what it's like you just put like pitchfork hot coals and you know you appreciate I appreciated this scene. It's a throwaway scene in the movie, but it's a legit sweat lodge scene. And I love that Jimmy looks twice. He's pissed at him because he's like, hey, he's like, this is a spiritual ceremony. You're desecrating. We're in the middle of an Anipi ceremony. Do you drag people from their churches while they're praying? And this is so powerful. One, because it's delivered by John freaking Trudell. And this is the truth. There's such reverence in churches and, and, and even in cinema. Um, I don't know if it's like this in real life, how much of this is sensationalized in the movies. But there's always like a scene in cop movies or movies where there's a bust of some kind. Some kind of mafia or mob member or criminal is sitting in a church. They'll wait till the service is over. They won't go and interrupt the service. They won't say, hey, preacher, you know, hey, reverend, I'm going to, you know, arrest these people. They always wait because they have like respect for the church. They have respect for the, the arena so they don't do that. They'll wait till they file out after church. Then they'll arrest them in the parking lot, you know. Um, but, you know, native ceremonies, we can interrupt that. That stuff's not real. We don't acknowledge that. So I, I really like that they address that. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that um, really gets explained. And I, you know, it, while it's off-putting to you as a native person, like, they address it like this one. Like, had they just arrested him and... John Trudell, Jimmy didn't have that line. I think I would have had a problem with it. But Jimmy's like, hey, man, this is a freaking ceremony. Why are you interrupting this? This is sacred. So the next scene, they are, they're trying to get Jimmy to go back to his apartment. I'm sorry, back to his house to basically just, uh, you know, just search the house. So they take him back to this, like, I, I say, I guess, just kind of like a government-funded, you know, housing program. And... And just like, all right, you know, we're going to kick the door down. He's like, can't kick the door down. You know, uh, the goons just came and did that last week. You know, just, I got a, I got a key under the coffee can and a coffee can under the stairs. You know, just reach in there and grab it. So he tricks, um, he tricks uh, Frank Cattell to, uh, <laughs> Cooch to dig his hand under the stairs. And it's really a badger pit. He digs his hand there, gets bit by a badger, gives him an opportunity to flee, and he does. So the FBI, you know, starts firing a bunch of things. But before he does, he does this awesome thing that, uh, you know, John Trudell has his hands. Jimmy has his hands uh, handcuffed behind him. And he runs full speed. And he's running, running, running. Steps, jumps on top of a hood of a car and jumps really high in the air. And while he's in midair, he takes his hands that are tied behind his back, tucks it and somehow like tucks his knees into his chest and gets his arms and wrists under his shoes and then is able to have his handcuffed hands in front of him. And I always thought that was so badass. Like he, I can't tell you how many times I tried that as a, as a kid. I would use like hay string or plastic handcuffs, like cheap toy handcuffs. I have like so many scabs on my face. 
and stuff because that's that's really hard <laughs> it's really hard to do um so i thought that was cool anyway uh so the fbi they you know fire a bunch of shots at jimmy and this is like the first thing uh that we, first time we learn that jimmy's a shapeshifter it's only alluded to of course because they got him cornered in this like travel trailer and they light this thing up and and then he turns into a deer of what we can imagine because if they open it up they just find the feather that was in his hair and that's it and there's another door in the travel trailer that was used and he jumps over a fence so this is the first time that i've ever seen shape-shifting done this casually there's no goddamn like werewolf transformations you know there's they just say he's a shapeshifter and it's done and because it's uh in the community and everybody understands it there's no reverence around it of just like oh he's a shapeshifter uh, and they just make it the casual of like yeah people do that people are like that but i will say this as navajo i would never tell an outsider that someone's a shapeshifter even if i knew we call him Yana Gloshi. He's like, I would never tell someone that someone's a Yana. One, you're not supposed to because it's like, that's a witchcraft. I don't know what shapeshifting is like in other native tribes because it's all different. But I just wouldn't tell that to somebody. Because Maggie Eagle Bear eventually tells Ray Lavoy that like, yeah, you know, Jimmy, oh, you need a shapeshifter. I'm just like, this is an FBI officer. You're going to say that? You know, you went to Dartmouth. You're smart. Don't tell him that. What the hell's wrong with you? You're, you're He's going to think you're crazy. I just I just didn't like that that was like one thing like in the writing I'm just like you really don't understand it do you like you think you know but you really don't know because you just you wouldn't explain it too like you would just kind of allude to it and like leave it alone because that's like powerful shit you don't talk about that kind of stuff and and they don't just do it haphazardly like it's a superpower and I didn't like that either like normally that kind of stuff is there's like ceremony around that there's like powerful there's powerful magic at work there's powerful things that you need to have in in order to do that like it's not just like oh jimmy's a shapeshifter he went now now he has that ability on command for the rest of time like it doesn't work like that and that's kind of it's kind of what it's made out to be in this and you know and i'm not an expert by any means i'm just going off of my experience my you know, oral traditions, my, my stories about all this, like this is, there's usually a lot of preparation done to do something like that. And in this movie, it's just like, oh, you know, here's my magic decoder ring, or here's my utility belt. Thank God I got that shapeshifter skill down, you know, and I'm going to turn into a deer, jump over this fence. I'm going to turn into a bird because I want to fly today. It's not, that's romanticized. I didn't like that part. Um, But I did say, I thought it was cool that they included it in here. Like, that was pretty awesome. And it wasn't sensationalized to that degree where it's like, it's got to be a werewolf transformation, you know. Um, so, anyway, I'll keep going. So, Ray and the FBI are just standing by. And good old Walter Crowhorse, you know. I, I Eventually, um, where was I? Okay. So, after this, uh, you know, Badger incident, after the shape-shifting incident... The goons and everyone, they're looking for Jimmy. So now the search is on for Jimmy. And they're wondering what the hell's going on. And so they they, they really they ransack the town looking for Jimmy. People's houses, they go through the school. And that's where we kind of meet Maggie Eagle Bear for the first time because she's a teacher there. And then we see Walter Crowhorse. He drives on by and flips off Ray Lavoie. And so Ray's like, what the hell is he going? So he follows him. And we learn that Walter is basically like... A really intelligent cop he's like a sherlock holmes kind of guy because he really knows what happened you know even though it's he's out of his jurisdiction he tells ray Levo- he tells ray leo wasn't killed here man he was dumped here out of a car bald tread muffler held on with bailing wire 1960 chevrolet blue and white leo's own car it's still missing i love the detail on that though muffler hanging on with bailing wire <laughs> that's a great that's a great thing um because it's so damn true anyway graham green was legendary in this one because he was like whoever killed leo walks heel toe planet grade like a white man jimmy has an indian walk carries about 140 pounds this guy was a big son of a buck based on the depth of that print i'd say he goes 210 215 you can tell me how much change he had in his pocket yeah 63 cents <laughs> walter found some like excellent point 
like excellent time to just like include humor and i love that about him and if you've i've seen interviews of graham green he is a wise ass like it's impossible to get a straight answer out of him in any interview and i don't know if that's just because he doesn't like interviews or whatever or if that's really how he is when you converse with him but i saw so much of who graham green really is in walter crowhorse and i really like that um but bottom line this whole scene is really just there to let you know that like hey walter said that you know he was dumped there where you guys found him they're trying to pin it on aim arm and you know he's got some red limestone in his gunshot wounds there's only one place on the res you can find red limestone and that's near maggie eagle bear's place at the riverbed of little walking river so you should go check that place out and uh yeah so he does that and then ray lavoy goes to maggie eagle bears and you know eventually meets maggie and grandma and then richard yellowhawk is also there and i love this because ray ray is there trying to talk to the grandma you know she runs inside the house and the truck comes up and richard yellowhawk is sitting there he's hanging out the passenger side of the truck and he says well 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 the washington redskin <laughs> to ray and that was fucking gold that line is so spot on so aware of the redskin so aware of like the name so like there's just so much tied it that was just like a perfect joke it was a perfect line and uh, i also love the authenticity of just all the kids riding in the truck bed there's kids riding in truck beds throughout this entire movie it i love it's that accurate you hate to see it because there's no seat belts but god damn it's so accurate like um so Maggie tells Ray that she just saw Jimmy. That's where she first tells him, like, hey, he's a shapeshifter, you know, and it blows Ray away. He doesn't believe him. You know, she thinks she's crazy. And eventually they get into an argument of, like, you know, because Ray's being an asshole. And Maggie tells him, like, you're an ass. You know, he's ignorant. He doesn't understand the traditional ways. He thinks it's all, you know, just a bunch of crap. And ray tries to identify as native he tries to connect with them and he just like talks his way into being ignorant and then maggie's like you asshole you know i went to spent four years at dartmouth you know she went to dartmouth she knows her rights she's not gonna let ray push her around and then they end the argument and ray has his first encounter with a mirage of ghost dancers off in the distance so this happens throughout the movie but really, it's just showing that he's special, that he has some kind of connection to the land, to the people. So then flash to the bar that night, you know, Ray is with his boss writing the statement about what happened. They're lying about the Badger incident. And then Frank gets told by Ray, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on a hot tip right now about uh, Maggie Eagle Bear. You know, I found a gun casing near the riverbed, not near where we, where we found the leo fast elk and he's like what the hell is going on how'd you find that he's trying to discredit you know he's, oh the tribal cop told me walter crowhorse he's like you watch out for him man he just dicks us around he's not out there to help us he's not real law enforcement kind of thing so that's where we kind of learn that like frank the fbi and the tribal police they don't get along they don't trust each other and you know he's like we got to get some tape you know if you're gonna go there talking to maggie eagle bear you need to record that you know it's no longer in and out you're gonna be eating fried bread and dog soup for many moons to come ray you know now get the fuck out there and get the traditionalist talking they're hiding him he wants them to get on tape that because maggie eagle bear is an arm member she wants her to like divulge where jimmy is and just get it done get it done because they already convinced that jimmy had done it so they just want to catch him and pin the murders on him um then like somebody throws a Molotov cocktail into the bar. It's a white bar, and uh, you know you can surmise that as an arm member trying to spook everybody. And uh, yeah, so the next day Ray's out to find Maggie again when he gets pulled over by Frank. And I love this scene because Walter pulls him over and he gives him a line about. <laughs> well, first of all, he pulls him over for going 59 and 55, and then as he gets out of his vehicle, his squad car. He's walking over to Ray's car. You see this truck coming down, and Ray, or I'm sorry, Walter acknowledges it, like, hey, you know. And there's like three kids in the backseat of the truck, which is a major violation, which is more like of a shitty thing to do than be four miles over the speed limit. But 
you know, it's whatever. I think this is like the essence of the res. I love that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it pulls him over and he's just like, all right, let me see the radar. And Walter's like, I don't need no radar. I can just tell. Just listen to the wind. He said, 59, nail him. <laughs> um, but then he get, he reveals like, hey, I, I pulled you over because Grandpa Sam reaches. Old man wants to talk to you. So they venture over to his trailer. And I love this because it's such a res house. You know, you got every ride this man's ever known, sitting ever owned, sitting out front. Like, that's such a res thing to do. It's just a junkyard of rides, a rundown travel trailer. That's a res home. And it's just like home. You know, I loved it. Um, and then they bring up like, hey, you got to bring offer some tobacco when you talk to an elder. And Ray, that's like news to Ray. And so they eventually do that. Um there's some education like that where they kind of drop these in there of like when you talk to an elder you got to use tobacco when you do this you got to do this and so i i kind of like that i was just like subtly trying to educate the crowd that was pretty cool but when they make it in there i love it that the grandpa is just watching mr magoo just watching cartoons that's such a grandpa like elder thing to do um and he this is cool because in this scene grandpa sam reaches speaks to him in lakota He's just hundred percent Lakota, and then, and then Graham Greene, Walter Crowhurst translates the entire thing, and it's pretty cool. Like they, you know, he kind of pulls the wool over his eyes, gets him to trade, um, you know, uh, Ray LaVoy's <laughs> Ray Bands for basically just a, you know, seemingly just a generic rock. There's nothing significant about it, but but what was cool in this scene is he brings out this rattle. It's 500 years old, this turtle rattle. And he said, like, my grandfather, grandfather, grandfather had this thing. So it's a very special rattle. It's very old. And he starts rattling it. And then he basically starts to reveal why he wants Ray to come. Because of this, he's like, I knew you were coming. I knew who you are before you even got here because I had a vision describing, like, who that you were going to come and who you are. And so he starts shaking that rattle. He starts describing, like, Ray Lavoie as a kid. You know, saying when he was young that, uh, you know, he he basically started ignoring his dad. And his dad was trying to pick him up from school one time. And, you know, he ignored him. And so you can see that, that, um, that off of Ray Val Kilmer's reactions, that's like, he's like, oh shit, like this is real. You know, of like, I don't like this. He really knows something that I, that, that nobody knows, that I don't tell to anybody. And then Ray leaves, he's pissed, you know. And Graham Greene tells, Walter Crowhurst tells Ray, he's like, the old man saw an owl last week. So what? The owl is a messenger. I mean, somebody's going to die. The owl told him about Leo. The owl told him about Leo? He also said, listen to the water. Listen to the water. Listen to the owl. He also said, don't trust Mr. Magoo. He said you're chasing the wrong man. Jimmy didn't do it. So, at this point, Grandpa Sam reaches has information that like nobody has. He's basically saying like, I knew all this was going to happen, you know, basically being the elder, but also saying like educating the movie watchers of like owls are bad omens. And it's like that in, in, in Navajo culture too. Like you see owls, they're messengers of death. They're messengers of bad things. You know, when we see them, we go check on family members, close friends, make sure everything's okay. Usually they have some kind of like prayer done. That's why, like, you don't give owl figurines to Navajos or Native Americans. Um, yeah, you shouldn't do that. But uh, So Ray goes back to Maggie Eagle Bear's place. And this time he comes bearing gifts because he learned, like, hey, you got to bring tobacco to elders. So he has, like, four cartons of cigarettes for her and everything. He gets in, and he eventually gets his way in there to go talk to Grandma. And But then, so in this conversation, he learns, like, he talks to Grandma. He learns a little bit about him, blah, blah, blah. But Maggie Eagle Bear, that's where she starts telling him, like, what she's been up to. You know, Maggie Eagle Bear has gone to the news because there's contaminated drinking water. There's, like, out of nowhere, people started saying, uh, started getting sick all over the res because of the drinking water. Or she's claiming it's because of the drinking water. And then she, like, drops this, like, heaping pile of, like, unsolved deaths. Saying there's been, like, 60 ish deaths of the, uh, you know, armed people, American Indian Movement, Ameri uh, you know, the uh, ARM. And they're all unsolved murders you know be an fbi agent freaking cheap guy like you come in here asking for us all this you won't help us out with that 
you know, like do something, help us out. You say you're here to help, help. Um, and then she's mentioning too, like what really was happening at the time, Richard Wilson, AKA Jack Milton in the movie, you know, he's misappropriating child funds away or tribal funds away from the schools and the health programs. So clearly, clearly Maggie's like really involved in the community. And so later on, she ends up being killed because it's no surprise that she got targeted because of how much she knows what she does. You know, she's, uh, she's got a lot going on. And why this is important is while they're talking, you know, gunfire erupts in the house. Goons light up the house. Everyone's okay except for the son. The son gets shot in the arm when he was trying to reach for his toy. So they make him to the hospital. You know, he ends up being okay. Um, take him to a crowded IHS. You know, this writer clearly understands the health conditions, the health care facilities on the res. Um, but... You know, back to incident in Oklahoma, this actually happened, except they, you know, there was a woman with, you know, uh, as I said, Anna Aquash, Anna, Anna Mae Aquash, like she actually had this happen to her son in the movie, and it was done by goons. And so Ray Lavoie sees goons kind of just sitting out, because at this point, you can tell that the goons are trying to get, get after Maggie, um, because they end up killing her in the movie later on. That drive-by was for Maggie. They want to get rid of Maggie Eagle Bear. She's no good. She's on to what they're... She's going down the trail of revealing what they're really about. So they try to take her out. So they're hanging out inside the hospital. Ray Lavoie, like, starts to go out there and beat the shit out of some goons. And then he's called off by Frank and Jack Milton. And they're riding together. So clearly they got some kind of connection. And, uh... Yeah. So it's really like shows like the futility of like, hey, tribal chairman's like in tight with the FBI. Tribal police don't even have a relationship with the FBI that, that that's positive in any way. So after this race place on assignment at grandpa's place at the and um, they're still trying to figure out like, OK, everyone goes to grandpa from aim from arm. Everyone goes to grandpa. So hang out there. Jimmy's bound to turn up. And so the next day, he follows Walter and Grandpa to a powwow. And Walter's convinced that he knows who he killed, who killed Leo Fast Elk. Ray's trying to help him out. And I love that Walter and Ray, like, there's a lot of education there. You know, because Ray's like, you know, that they, there's, there's scum out there that killed Leo Fast Elk. We need to find out who that is. And Walter says, that scum is an enemy of the United States. You know, Ray, when we were kids, we used to play Cowboys and Indians. I always wanted to be Gary Cooper. I didn't want to be an Indian. The government boarding school made sure of that. It cut off my hair, washed my mouth out with soap when I spoke my own language. My own language, Ray. When the armed warriors came here, it was like an awakening. I got the people proud of their heritage, their elders, language, and you call them enemies? So it really paints the picture of like what arm aim was trying to do for the people in the community. You know, the people that were being disconnected from their culture, their language, and why people supported them so much, and why they were willing to hide for the hide things on their behalf, hide things from law enforcement, you know, shelter people. And it's pretty cool. And this was a real powwow. You know, I didn't really, this wasn't staged. <laughs> I mean, maybe it was, but they just ended up having a powwow. Um, it was pretty cool. I like that. It was authentic. Uh, and then later that night, they end up going back to Grandpa Sam Reach's and they're all sitting around a fire. And the original cut of this movie, they're all drinking peyote water. And they don't have, they don't show that in later cuts for some reason. I don't know if it's because of like the stigma around peyote water or drinking peyote. But like you see Ray, Val Kilmer's character, like starting to freak out. And there's a line that kind of reveals what it really used to be is because he eventually starts freaking out because he sees his dad across the other side of the fire he sees him his dad and him as a kid like trying to talk to his dad and um he ends up running away into the dark and walter follows him and he's like i know you're scared i know you're scared it's okay and because he's freaking tripping out peyote man <laughs> um and eventually they have a fight and we learn that grandpa sam reaches can you know uh speak english because he tells him to knock it off but why this scene is important is because they talk about Red Deer Table. There's something calling him to Red Deer Table, and that's he needs to go there. And multiple times throughout the movie, 
Grandpa Sam reaches and, you know, it, Grandpa Sam reaches over and over, keeps telling him, like, Red Deer Table is important. <clears throat> you need to go out there. So Ray heads back to the hotel and, you know, has a quick conversation with his boss. And, you know, basically, you're just starting to get the feeling that Frank Cattell isn't that kid. He doesn't care about the community. He just wants to catch Jimmy. So, the, so later on that night, Ray goes back to Sam Reach's place because he's still on stakeout. He's still on lookout for Jimmy. And he gets shot at in the middle of the night while he's sitting in his truck. So the next day, they go and storm Sam Reach's place. And they're just like looking around for anything. Then we learn that Walter has found the vehicle of Leo Fast Elk. And so Ray Lavoy and his boss, Frank, they're, you know, they're off on a drive and they come across Walter and he's like, Hey, I found that freaking car, man. Look at it. And they're pointing at a river and it's right there. And Frank and Piss is pissed that the FBI missed it, that the freaking tribal policeman who's not in jurisdiction is the one that found it. And they pull that thing out and they start they start digging around looking and they find a jacket in the bag. And Ray takes out a raffle ticket. He's like, oh, I could probably do something with this. So he takes it to Maggie Eagle Bear because that jacket with the raffle ticket in there could tell him like, hey, this is the person who wore this jacket is probably the one who shot Leo Fast Elk. So Maggie Eagle Bear had done a raffle you know, earlier before the movie ever took place and has one half of the ticket stub. She has the other half because she collected all the money for the raffle. She's like, hey, can you look this up for me? Can you tell me who had the other, who bought this ticket? Because that'll tell me probably who's the one that killed Ray or who killed Leo Fast Elk. That'll help me out. And she reluctantly agrees eventually. But this conversation is important because we learn about Ray's father. We learn that he knew him pretty well, that he drank himself to death. It sounds like he was a hell of an iron worker, you know. Um, but after this, Ray goes to the Wounded Indian Burial Grounds. And this is important because he has a vision of being at the Wounded Knee Massacre. He runs, you know, he immediately looking at the burial uh, memorial grounds, he sees a U.S. cavalry soldier on horseback, you know, running toward him, galloping toward him. And this part was cool because as he's running over the hill, like you see other natives, like mostly women and children, because that's who were massacred primarily in at Wounded Knee, you see them running alongside Ray, and they're all in, like, period-appropriate attire. And so eventually he gets shot in the back, and he wakes up in, like, a cold sweat. Then heads to Grandpa's house because he's like, shit, I got to go see Grandpa because this is crazy. You know, I, I, I need some answers as to why this is happening. And then he arrives at Grandpa's house, and who's there? Freaking Jimmy looks twice. You know, Jimmy's like, why don't you have a red deer table like the old man says? You know, Ray's like, you... You need to get out of here, man, before they get the hell out of here, before they kill you. And then the famous, famous Jimmy Looks Twice line. Sometimes they have to kill us. They have to kill us because they can't break our spirit. Freaking chills. Chills. Um, so Jimmy and Grandpa are, are you know, <laughs> like, you, we, we know you saw some shit. We know you have a, we know you had a vision. You need to go to Red Deer Table. Like, the spirits are calling you out there. So Ray's now intrigued. He gets it. They're about to, you know, and, and Ray LaVoy is just like, he's torn. He's like, do I get out of here? Do I arrest Jimmy? What the hell do I do? So he's starting to like turn now to the other side because then Jimmy says, we choose the right to be who we are. We know the difference of reality of freedom and the illusion of freedom. There's a way to live with the earth and there's a way not to live with the earth. We choose the way of the earth. And then the out of nowhere, the FBI comes out of nowhere. Freaking... Raids the place, takes away Jimmy in a helicopter, like, in no time. That's the last we ever see of John Trudell and then, uh, in this movie. And then in the process, they smash Grandpa's 5-year-old rat, 500-year-old rattle with no reverence. You know, just basically exemplifying these white people don't give a shit about these people, about the Lakota, or Oglala. Um, the goons show up with Fred Ward. You know, he drops the painful, uh, whoosh day. <laughs> um... So at this point, really, the, the case is wrapped up. They're like, good, we got our guy. Jimmy looks twice. He, we're going to pin the murders on him. It's over. It's a wrap. Good job. See ya. Go back to D.C. So Ray is about to go and back to his hotel, but Grandpa is sitting in his vehicle. 
and he tells them is the this is where we learn why this movie is called Thunderheart. This is why we learn ultimately why Val Kilmer is in this movie is because just like Frank Fool's Crow, Grandpa Sam Reaches was a one year old during the one knee wounded knee massacre. You know, they shot three hundred Lakota. And he said during that Wakayan Chante, aka Thunderheart, was killed during the running for the stronghold. And that's where the movie ends, is the stronghold. That's why he goes there, because of this story that Grandpa Sam Reaches tells him. And then we learn that's who Ray gets his blood from. That's who he's a descendant of. And he tells him, Thunderheart, the spirits told him that Thunderheart was sent back in the form of you to help the people heal. That's what he was told. So then he tells him, run for the stronghold, Thunderheart. Run. The soldiers are coming. So at this point, like Ray's got conviction. He's a he's a believer. He goes back to the burial grounds and he just wants to like confirm. He finds a headstone and uh, with a bunch of names on it of people who were killed at wounded knee. And sure enough, Thunderheart's one of those names, you know? And so he's just like, Oh, oh god, this is real. This is real. Old man's not you know, not blowing smoke. He's he's a little joke. Um so Ray goes back to his room to get ready to pack. And then he finds that Maggie Eagle Bear had sent him a letter. And he opens it up and it's the other half of the raffle stub. And then we find out that that is um, Richard Yellowhawk went and bought that. So Richard Red R- R- Yellowhawk is the one who was a well, well, well. The Washington Redskin. Um, you know, he's wheelchair bound in this movie. And we also learn that he cut a plea deal because there's a do not file mugshot that he finds in the FBI files when he looks up Richard Yellowhawk. So just as he's about to leave his hotel room, he hears some rustling in the bathroom. And this is important because he goes into the bathroom and there's an owl. He sees an owl in the window seal and the owl takes off. And what's the owl? Harbinger of death. It's a messenger of death. So... That was a pretty cool way to like circle back that, uh, you know, or call back to the education of what owls are, you know, really kind of making it come full circle. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, so Ray goes over to Richard Yellowhawk's place, and this is a res looking house. I love the, authentic- the authenticity of this. Just a wood stove right in the middle of it. Like you can tell this was real. They didn't build this for the movie, <laughs> this was a real res home. Um, so he confronts him and he's like, Richard, I know you took a plea deal, you know, and you helped out so and so. What's really going on? You know, you're the one that killed Leo Fast Elk. And then we learn that Richard Yellowhawk, well, one, isn't really in a wheelchair. He's kind of faking it. So he stands up. So he's that big 210, 215 dude that uh, Walter Crowhorse was talking about. But we also learn that Frank Cutell, who is Ray's boss, is the one that set up the whole plea deal. You know, he's like, yeah, he's the one that gave me the guns to kill Leo Fast Elk. And at this point, Ray's like, shit, my boss is involved with all this. The FBI is involved behind all these murder, all these murders. So then he leaves. And then Ray, later, right immediately after that, takes off with Walter Crowhorse. They finally go to Red Deer Table. They go to this place because they're like, hey, this whole movie, this whole time, they're telling me to go to Red Deer Table. I'm going to finally go. And then Ray tells him about his vision, about running with the people during the Wounded Knee Massacre. And Walter is fucking pissed. And I quote, you were running with the old ones at the D? You know, just before they caught Jimmy, you know, that's all, I'll read this one. Because <laughs> you know, Ray, Ray tells him, just before they caught Jimmy, I had a dream. I was running with other Indians at the Wounded Knee Cemetery. I was shot in the back. And then Walter looks at him. You were running with the old ones at the knee? It was just a dream. Who the hell are you, man? What do you mean? You had yourself a vision. A man waits a long time to have a vision. And he may go his whole life without having one. And then along comes some instant Indian with a fucking Rolex and a brand new pair of shoes. A goddamn FBI to top it all off. Has himself a vision. And I like this because... I think the movie would be less than had it, had this not been addressed. For a native person, you truly would be pissed if somebody who is a distant native, who is native by blood but not by like connection to the community, connection to the land or language, 
and they're the ones that are selected, pinpointed by the ancestors to have these visions. But the truth is, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> I mean, who knows? This this is like the one percent of the one percent. Like, there's this is so unlikely. It technically is possible, I guess, but it's just like, ugh, I don't know. But why this is important is Graham Greene's reaction is legit. That's how natives would feel. Just like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, some some dude that's never like lived the struggle. Some dude that doesn't know the language. Some dude that doesn't even know like what his clans are. You know, if you're a Navajo anyway. Like doesn't have any connection. Doesn't know like where his grandma's house is. Like never lived on the res. He's the one that gets to have a connection to the old ones. To the Wounded Knee Massacre. He gets, he's the one that's selected by the spirits. He's the one that's Thunderheart reincarnate. So it really is like that, that, that being pissed off is real genuine. And I, I like that. So once they go to Red Deer Table, that they see, they see why this is important, why they, why they keep getting called there, why the water's contaminated. The government is test drilling for uranium. And Fred, the tribal chairman, he's getting kickbacks from the government, which is why he hires the goons to keep the traditionalists pacified. And that's why the water was getting contaminated. And that's why Maggie Eagle Bear going and telling the news about the contamination was bad news. That's why they killed her. And they do find her there at Red Deer Table. They find her dead body. Um, and then so Ray goes back to uh, Richard Yellowhawk's place the next morning because they're like, oh, shit, oh, shit. You know, this is really starting to come together. We really got to do something. And they find Richard Yellowhawk dead. He's been murdered. And then they get out of the house and they're like, oh, my gosh. And then this is where the big chase ensues because the goons got him cornered. And then Ray's boss tries to communicate with him over radio. And then Ray tells him, like, hey, I got this whole thing recorded, man. Everything that uh, Richard told me about you being involved with the murder, I got it on tape. Proof that he's behind the death of Leo Fastilk. And then in, you seemingly see them get cornered. And then he takes off to the stronghold. You know, which is basically a bottleneck. There is no way out. You know, it's it's a dead end. It's not a bottleneck. It's a dead end. And, you know, everyone's like, where the hell is he going? And But this goes back to what Grandpa Sam Reach has told him. He's like, run, Thunder Heart, run to the stronghold. Because the arm members are all waiting there. And we, you know, Ray gets there. They all get out of the vehicle. Tells him he knows about the uranium. He knows about, you know, what's really going on. He knows about your kickbacks you're giving him, blah, blah, blah. And then gives him the opportunity to, you know, come back to the F, you know, and then Frank is just like, all right, man, you're, you're you're going crazy here. Give you a chance to come clean and just come back over, you know, and or, or we're going to have to kill you. And he's like, fine, you're going to kill you. And then the famous, I say famous, but the, the, the big line in the movie when he just says, this land is not for sale, you know, he drops that. And then see, that's kind of the last thing that Val Kilmer says, um, because um, just as the FBI is about to open fire and the goons are about to open fire, the arm all come out. Out of nowhere, all these natives just come out. They all got rifles. You got grandmas with their skirts on. These old chays, these old grandpas, and you know, young, young and old, women, men, everybody. They all have rifles. They all come out. They're all aimed at the goons, at the FBI. And then that's when Val Kilmer says, this land is not for sale. And then the scene ends. And the last scene is really Walter and Ray at the graveyard. They're looking over Maggle Eagle Bear's uh, cross. And we learn that Frank's going to um, be investigated. And Ray is going to go public with the tape that he took of Frank's guilt. And then we're going to see where it goes there. And then Ray and Walter have an exchange and blah, blah, blah. So this is basically where the movie ends. But before, you know, the, the last thing, thing of the movie is throughout the movie... Grandpa Sam Reaches was trying to get uh, Ray LaVoy's watch because it was a nice watch. He's like, no, I got this from my grandparents. I can't give this to you. He finally does give it to him. And then at the end, he exchanges with him kind of the pipe, the tobacco pipe that they were using throughout the movie. And then the movie ends. You know, at that point, Ray is no longer an FBI agent. And he's just another guy, you know, being an advocate for Native people and trying to do his best to shed some light on some atrocities going on. So, <clears throat> so that was it. This is a long episode. So, hour 14 in, 
and just through the plot. So thankfully, positives, negatives, final thoughts, I'll kind of blow through this. I kind of weave them into the plot review. So as I mentioned before, costumes are on point. Let's talk about the positives. Um, there's no stereotypes in this. This is just regular natives living life. There were no drunken Indians highlighted in this. There was no stoic Indians. Yeah, there were feathers. Yeah, there were people that were like stoic and didn't talk, but they talked and they said like mean shit to <laughs> to Ray LaVoy. You know, they looked at him and didn't say anything because he's an outsider. They looked at him and didn't say anything because they're like, who the hell is this guy? Who the hell is this Washington Redskin? So there were random feathers thrown in on the cap of like Walter Crowhorse, but that was like natural looking. That's like what people do, you know, um, occasionally. But nothing felt forced in this movie, except like Val Kilmer's storyline at times. I feel like they were trying to fit like a round peg into a, or a square hole. What, what do they say? A square peg into a round hole. Like it just didn't fit at times. But as far as the costumes go, my gosh, it was legit. Um, I love that this was on a real res. It was not a stage location. You know, this wasn't like Hollywood trying to recreate it. This was like Pine Ridge Res, and it was like actual res life, so it was authentic. I appreciated that. Um, I think another positive is a white person told a story about natives that wasn't messed up. Like, he got it pretty good. You know, I mean, he got it better than Wind River, in my opinion. <laughs> I think Wind River had its ups and downs, but this wasn't poverty porn. There were instances of poverty porn when they kind of addressed it, but after a while, you're just like, this is just life for them, and it kind of didn't keep addressing it. Um, it did have like a bleak outlook of like this time they won, but they won't keep winning. Um, but it was, it was, it was a win for 1992, honestly. This movie and Last of the Mohicans coming out the same year, phenomenal, you know. Um, I also love that they addressed, you know, I said that it would be problematic if it really happened in real life of a distant kind of native being selected by the creator by the ancestors by the spirits to be somebody special the people who actually live in the community would be fucking furious because you're like why would i want an outsider to come help me somebody i don't know i don't trust you're i'm supposed to take your word that you're a descendant from the spirit or you're a descendant of this particular bloodline so they use like grandpa sam reaches to be someone in the community they respect to be the the person that vouches for him and I love that they address it of like Val Kimmer being the chosen one, quote unquote, like pisses everybody off. You know, everyone's like the fucking Washington Redskins, the chosen one. I like that they address that. And my favorite part about this is the humor, Walter Crowhorse and just the lines. You know, it's the best thing about the movie. The writing got it on point, captures the reality of res life and just, I don't know. I really, I love it, you know. I love it. Just, just solid. Negatives. Um, you know, I feel like Walter was an awesome character. He was an awesome police officer, but he was the shit until like Ray LaVoy came around. And maybe it was like he had to be, he had to succumb to the jurisdiction issue. But I felt like at times he really was like second fiddle, and he shouldn't have been. Because he knows the land better than the white cops. He knows the community better than the white cops. He probably would have gotten more information from Grandpa before from Sam Reaches. But, you know, I guess that's nit nitpicky. But um, the I definitely see the Lone Ranger and Tonto dynamic. But this is technically more like Tonto and Tonto. More like Tonto and Tonto from uh, Smoke Signals. Anyway, um... I get it, like, Val Kilmer's not really native, but it's technically a native and a native thing. So, I don't know. I But my biggest negative with this, honestly, is pretendians. This movie will make non-native people, specifically white people, feel like ancestry is enough to be connected. Because <clears throat> all you need is someone in your past that was native. Maybe they were a Cherokee princess. Maybe they were a chief. Maybe they were someone important because Tagashida, you know, Tagashida, you know, sent them. I'm, I have, I have serious like Indian bloodlines and my, my bloodlines have strong medicine. 
You know, I, I feel spiritually connected. I really feel like this does that for people who get those 23andMe and DNA tests. Like movies like this can make you feel like, oh, maybe I'm important. Maybe my bloodline's special. Yeah, it's distant. Yeah, I'm only 3% or 4%, but maybe it's really special. It's just like, Jesus, man. I don't like that part. I think that's like, you can like hate this movie because of that, or you can kind of look past it. Um, but I really don't like that because let's say this was real. Let's humor the movie. Val Kilmer, Ray Lavoy really goes back and Grandpa Sam reaches, says like, hey, Takashida, the spirits are saying that this guy's special. While Grandpa Sam Reaches might be a medicine man, while Grandpa Sam Reaches might have been there at Wounded Knee, I'm 100% positive the community would not accept that. That's where the writer got it wrong in a way. Um, because the community wouldn't take that. I don't care how respected Sam Reaches is, you're not going to have an FBI agent be trusted by the community because Grandpa Sam Reaches is like, hey... He's a descendant from Thunderheart. And it's just like, Grandpa, I hate to tell you this, man, but I think you're losing it. Like, I really don't think that there's a reality where that would play out that way. With all that civil unrest going on, to have an FBI agent be trusted to be the person that's going to take them from, you know, their current state. Um, and people say that this is a white savior uh, movie. Yeah, it is because he's FBI, but if you know what shit's like in the tribe on, on the res, like you really need a non-native person to get through all that crap to like bring some of that to light because it shows like Maggie Eagle Bear, that really happens. Like people on the res will take actual issues to the forefront and until non-native famous people start talking about it or it gets to the mainstream, like no dapple, like the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. When people like, um, what the hell is her name? Shalane Woodley get arrested from protesting at Wounded Knee. I'm sorry, at uh, Dakota Access Pipeline when they were protesting the um, construction. When people, when people like that get arrested, you get it talked about at a larger scale because Shalane Woodley came in late in the game. You know, they were already protesting for days, weeks at that point. They had already been, you know, needing food, needing water. They had already been at that location for a while camping. And they made it seem like, oh, Shalane Woodley came and helped. And isn't this great? And then, you know, people like Mark Ruffalo and other celebrities started talking about it. So people that say, like, oh, it's a white savior movie. Like, yeah, I get it. But in real life, you really do need that help from everybody you really need allies that aren't from the reservation because we will fucking scream until we lose our voice and still it feels like sometimes like nobody will hear us like it has to go through the right channels it has to be heard by the right number of people for it to finally hit this like point of critical mass where it can the message can carry itself to who need who it needs to be heard from and even then it might even then nothing might happen so I, i'm okay with it Final thoughts, as a native person born and raised in the res, this is an awesome movie. I could see how non-native people could look at this and be like, oh, look at these poor people, more poverty porn. But uh, there's a lot to like about this movie. Um, you know, the Lone Ranger and Tonto complex, the White Savior, I don't I don't disagree with those. If somebody want to convince, would like to convince me otherwise, you know, I, I probably won't, won't, won't disagree with you. You know, just I'm, I'm simply saying from my experience as a res kid, I enjoyed this stuff in here. Like, I'm definitely going to show this movie to my son because it's cool. Um, I think there's some stuff that I'll probably explain, just like Val Kilmer was this guy who kind of went crazy, <laughs> uh, kind of went Santa Fe Indian. But um, I'm definitely going to show this to my son. You know, it's a long movie, but I enjoyed the heck out of it. Uh, yeah, I like it. All right. So longest episode, I think, maybe to date. But uh, I'll close with this. Next week, I'm going to do Grizzlies, The Grizzlies, the lacrosse movie <clears throat> uh, that came out on Netflix recently. It was released in 2018, 
but it just got dropped on Netflix. So I want to do that simply because it's available and people are starting to talk about it on social media, or at least that I'm seeing. And also, I keep talking about doing Magnificent Seven and Hostels and Bury My Heart at Wounded D. And I have some notes done for those, and I'll get to them. Um, but just movies keep getting put further in the queue, and those get bumped down. Uh, I want to do Skins also, and just because I love that film, and two, because it's on Prime, it's available for people. So to recap real quick, Incident at Oglala, it is available on Amazon Prime. Encourage everyone to listen or to watch that one. Check it out, especially if you don't know about Leonard Peltier and kind of the backstory with all that and Wounded Knee Incident. Incident at Wounded Knee, sorry. And yeah, Thunderheart. It's available for rent. I got it for three bucks on Amazon Prime. Um, really hope you all enjoyed this one. Talk to you later. Thank you.